starts out, brethren, I speak in terms of human relations, even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. What I am saying is this, the law which came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise, but God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. What we have seen, and I, what I hope that you have all gathered since we've been studying the book of Galatians, is the faith of those that uh, are truly captured by Christ and in no way would allow the gospel to be distorted in any way. It is a magnification of the faith that is given to them, to Paul and Titus and Barnabas and all of those that were raising up churches. And that faith has not changed. The faith that was given to them is given to us, although our times are much, much easier. We have it very easy. It is easy for us to come and worship uh, because you have provided that for us, Lord God. We do not have the circumstances that they had to incur and the punishment and the threats that they had to go through. Faith. What a precious commodity that is that was given to us. It determines everything about us. It determines our destination. And yet it is all of a gift. And we should treasure that. No matter what we are going through and what is surrounding us in this world, we can rest upon the faith that the Lord has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And though we are discouraged, maybe because of the attendance in Messiah Church, that's not the point. The point is that the faithful people that have been given faith are here. And they come to worship you, Lord God. And we need to understand that the promises of God for tomorrow are the anchor for all believers today. The pilgrimage of the Christian life is a pilgrimage of faith. It begins when God creates faith in our hearts. In the first stage of Christian experience, we embrace Christ and we trust him for our redemption. But the entirety of the pilgrimage of the Christian is rooted and grounded in that confidence and that trust. The whole process is defined by and living in faith. Colossians 2.6 Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in him. That's our obligation. You receive Christ. We are to walk in him. Not just during the time that we come here to worship, but every minute of every hour of every day, we are dependent upon him. He is not to be forgotten. When we seek to do our duties, our first thing should be that we pray. Lord God, help me in this task that you have given me. Help me in this job that you have procured for me. Christ came precisely to redeem his people from the curse of the law. That's Galatians 3.13. He became a curse 
for us. And the result is seen in verse 14 of this chapter. It is instead of the curse, we now inherit the blessing of Abraham. That is, we receive eternal life, which we have been granted for Christ's sake. And we are Christ's inheritance. And we are heirs with Christ. You are an inheritance of Christ. Did you know that? Did you realize that? If you are acquainted with scripture, you know that. Paul says, may the eyes of your heart be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of your calling. And what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance of the saints? God has given you to Christ. And Christ in his love for his father did not shy away from the cross. But he endured the shame. And he despised it. And he has sat down at the right hand of the father there to undergo intercession for us. We owe so much and yet can pay so little. Your being predestined procured for you, procured for you an inheritance. The text this morning has to do with theological content of the Abrahamic covenant uh, and the historical and theological relationship between the covenant and the law of Moses. Paul is comparing the promise that was given to Abraham compared to the law that was given to Moses. Galatians 3.15 Paul says, brethren, I speak in terms of human relations, even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. You realize, or if you remember what we have gone over so far, uh, Paul called them foolish Galatians for turning to things of the law, And when he spoke of foolish Galatians, actually he is inferring that they vacated their senses. They left their senses behind. But now he calls them brethren. What a marvelous thing to be called by an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're brethren. Not that we chose to be brothers or, and sisters. We do not choose any of that. It's all a gift. It is all by grace. So in Galatians 3.1, he called them foolish Galatians, which might seem a little harsh and severe, but to lessen and soften their resentment, he calls them brethren. It indicates that he is wishing them well and he's hoping good for them. And he's hoping that they are not so far gone that they might not be recovered. He's hoping that God has not abandoned them. But once called, God does not abandon anyone. Paul is blaming their leaders and teachers rather than them. The ones that are abandoned are the ones that were demanding work righteousness or, or circumcision and also that they were to obey the dietary laws. Paul compares God's promise to Abraham to the wills that we make. And we call such a document a last will and testament. The word testament, in fact, in that is from the same Greek word that we translate covenant. When someone writes their last will and testament, which I have done, and Rosemary has done, 
we put within that will our wishes and what was to be done with whatever we have. Among other things, the people that do this specify who are to be the beneficiaries. They are not under obligation to include them in the will. None. They are not under obligation to include them in any inheritance. And it is to be understood that if they are included as beneficiaries in this will, it is not anything that they have done to merit the inheritance that has been given to them. It is strictly by the one that is making the will. So you see how important the promise of God is to us. It is not based on anything that we merit, but it is based solely on God's predetermined promise to his people. And Paul says that even in the case of a human will, and once that it is validated and confirmed, the terms cannot be altered. They cannot be altered after the death of the testator. Its instructions must be carried out in every detail. The implication is that the testament of God, which is infinitely more trustworthy than any piece of paper that a man could write out, it is much more dependable and it is much more unchangeable. So Paul presents this as an illustration of why the Mosaic law cannot be interpreted as an annulment or alteration of the terms of the Abrahamic covenant. Now, in human beings that make out their will, if something occurs that would cause them to change uh, who's to receive what or not to receive what, that, they are still, you can still change that, but you must do that with a notary, a public, and it must be accorded with witnesses to do that. So, nothing which came after this legal arrangement with Abraham would change the original covenant that God made with him. Both the Gentile Christians in Galatia along with the Judaizers would have understood this example. They would have concluded that the blessing which was given to Abraham by God was received by Abraham by faith because he believed God and he believed the promises of God. It is an irrevocable agreement that God made with Abraham. It is described in a terms of the beneficiary of a trust in verse 16, his seed. The date of the trust, verse 17, 430 years later, and the condition for the inheritance is verse 18, which is based on a promise. The terms of this covenant really should cause us to appreciate the gracious, unconditional nature of God's love for us. The beneficiary, Galatians 3.16, now the promises were spoken to Abraham and his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. Concerning the promises given to Abraham, the Judaizers argued that they were only given to Israel since they were the seed or descendants of Abraham, but there was an atelier motive when they said that. Galatians 6.13. You see, they wanted to receive the adulations and praise of mankind. They were not really concerned about the Galatians 
they were more concerned about what they had them do. For these who circumcise do not even keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised so they can what? Boast in your flesh. Paul says God specified in his will that the beneficiaries were to be Abraham and his seed. The apostle Paul calls particular attention to the word seed, and we should pay attention to that too. It is distinguished from seeds in the plural. But it refers to the singular seed that God had in Christ, not all the blood descendants of Abraham. That's clearly illustrated in the first chapter of John, not by blood or the will of men, but by God we are born again. Paul informs us that the primary recipients of the Abrahamic covenant were Abraham and Christ. There you go. Abraham and Christ. But it also, as you're probably thinking, it also includes all those that are in Christ. This promise is not realized in Jews, but in Christians. Whether they are Jew or Gentile. For all that are in Christ are no longer Jew or no longer Gentile, and we need to stop separating the true. You're either a Christian or you're not. And also, all those in Christ, there's neither male or female. That's something I have a hang-up about. I noticed in the uh, Puritans and, and all the scholars before that, they always included he, 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 and it bothers me. <laughs> so I change that when I'm writing maybe something like a, uh, a devotion that I'm sending out. I change that to man or woman because it includes both. And I don't know if that bothers anybody else, but it always bothers because the ladies are the children of God as well as mankind. Oh, well, Kelly always used to say, oh, a woman is a man with a womb. There you go. How's that? <laughs> a man with a womb. <laughs> well, it's true. After Pentecost, the Holy Spirit unlocked the previously hidden truths of the first covenant. And when Christ was speaking to the apostles, he said, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now, he said. But when he, that's a capital H, when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. The interpretations that the New Testament inspired writers provide are, are sometimes difficult or different. They're really, what I really meant to say is they're very different from the prevailing teachings of today. The rabbis said this, and we're getting... You'll understand as we proceed in this morning's teaching what I'm talking about, and especially about the coming of Elijah. And on the Mount of Transfiguration, you know, when the disciples asked Jesus that question, well, didn't they say that Elijah was to come first? And Jesus said, well, yeah, but you all missed it. You know, John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. So, the Jewish people said this, that in the second year of Ahaziah, that was a king way, way back then, Elias was hid. He was a, a, a son of Jezebel. And you know, all know about Jezebel and her rottenness and, and that he was an idol worshiper. Well, people that have idols or are, are world worshipers, they don't have the Spirit of God dwelling with them. Uh, they are, in a sense, uh, abandoned. So at that time, there was no prophet. Elias was hid. 
And they say, nor will he appear till the Messiah comes. Then he will appear and will be hid a second time and then will not appear till Gog and Magog. You have to understand this is not biblical <laughs> scripture. This is what the rabbis were saying. But in a sense, they were more right than they realized when they said he will not appear again until the Messiah come. Malachi 4, 5. This is a First Testament prophecy with a New Testament fulfillment. In Malachi 4, 5. Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and the terrible day of the Lord. And that's clearly an indication judgment is coming. And they should have been aware of that. Without the New Testament, we would understand this, that Elijah was coming again before the second coming of Christ. This is how the disciples understood it. But because of what they had experienced on the Mount of Transfiguration, they asked Jesus this in Matthew 17, 10. He said, and his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? They understood it and knew that Elijah was to come prior to the parousia of the Lord. But according to Jesus, they had missed it. Matthew 17, 11, and 12. And Jesus answered them. He said, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. But I say to you, Elijah already came. And they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. The prophecy of Malachi was actually fulfilled but we need to understand it was not a natural fulfillment, but spiritual. John came in the spirit of Elijah, speaking to Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. The angel said, and it is he who will go, their son, as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of righteousness so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. What was John was baptizing for repentance. That's what his baptism was all about. Repent. Change your evil hearts. Worship the Lord. Don't worship the Lord. And though we live in a natural world and everything around us is, is natural except the spirit that dwells within us and I'm afraid that we seem to think naturally rather than spiritually. I know that is a, that is a big fault that I have to control within myself. You cannot go by what you see in front of you. We only go by the promises that God has made to us. You know, do not lean to your own understanding over and over and over again in Scripture. So the prophecy of Malachi was fulfilled. But it was not a natural fulfillment, but a spiritual in Luke 1.17. And it is he who goes as a forerunner before him sent in the power of Elijah. It is always the natural, then the spiritual. 1 Corinthians 15.46. However, you should all know this, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. We exist in this natural frame which houses a spiritual spirit that will eventually be clothed with what God has reserved in heaven for us. We have to lay down this clay tenement, as Peter said, and then we adorn the spiritual. We are natural right now, 
but our destiny is spiritual. And not every person in this world can say that because they will be accorded the second death, which we know is the lake of fire. A second death. Matthew, the 11th chapter, 13 through 14. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you care to accept it, Jesus said, he himself as Elijah was to come. So we understand through Christ that John the Baptist is the fulfillment of the prophecy that we saw, and he was to come before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Galatians 3.16, now the promises were spoken to Abraham and his seed. He does not say unto seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed that is Christ. The importance and the understanding of this verse cannot be overstressed. You ought to study it over and over. You ought to read every uh, good commentary on it to, to understand it. The promise or what promise is he talking about? This is in reference to the Abrahamic covenant and the promises that God made to Abraham. Promises are different than agreements. A promise is based on one person. When I told Tony that I would bring that phone to him, it was a promise. It was not an agreement. A promise is based on one person. Agreement is based on two individuals. If you do this, I will do that. You know, if you buy me ice cream, I will really like you. <laughs> well, right, that's true. <laughs> so we need to keep in mind that God's promise to Abraham was not an agreement but promises. The promise intended was a covenant of grace. And boy, we could really pass up that. A covenant of grace, which we all sit underneath that grace. Every one of us that have been given the faith of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is the realization of that covenant that God made as a promise to us. And it is all by grace. Yeah. So the covenant of grace mentioned in the next verse, which are so great you can probably, you can't even describe them. They're precious. They're better than those of any other covenant, of which all are yes and amen through Christ. That should kind of remind us of 2 Corinthians 1.20. You know, for as many are the promises of God, in him they are yes, Therefore, also through him is our amen to the glory of God through us. It kind of reminds me of Gerizim and Nabal where, where the tribes were divided up on two mountainsides and they would read a promise and one tribe would amen and then they would pronounce a curse and the other tribe would say amen to that. So our amen is through Jesus Christ to the glory of God through us. The promises are mainly spiritual in nature. Does that mean they are not tangible or real? Absolutely not. When you step into the promises and the revelation or the promises that God has for you, you will realize beyond all comprehension of what God has set in store for you. Then it will be tangible. Then it will be internal, eternal. All of that is around us is temporary. Everything. You go home and you say, look at my house. Oh, well, yeah, you're going to be there for a while. But someday somebody else will live in that house. So don't cherish those things too much. So these promises are a spiritual nature 
that all the temporal blessings of God's people come to us in a covenant way. And by virtue of the promise for godliness has the promise of this life that God will truly feed his people and will not withhold anything good from them. Psalm 84, 11. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. He never leaves or forsakes his children, but the promises intended here principally are that God will be our God and they shall be his people. Oh, wow. That's almost enough right there. I will be their God and they shall be my people. I think it says in Ezekiel that they would walk in my statues and keep my ordinances and do them. Then they shall be my people and I shall be their God. The promises of Christ as a Savior and a Redeemer of us. The Spirit as our sanctifier and the applier of grace to us. His blood as adoption through free grace and perseverance in grace and then the etern in eternal inheritance. These promises were made and were said or spoken to Abraham and his seed. That is, they were made manifest and applied to Abraham who was the father of many nations and were declared to belong to him and his spiritual seed. Well, who's that? Who's the spiritual seed? Even all that believe, whether Jew or Gentile. Genesis 12, 2 and 3. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. If you read that, the question is, are there any ifs included there? Are there any ifs in God's word to Abraham? This is not an agreement. It is a promise. And you can read the entire Genesis chapters 12 through 15 to find anywhere in there where God says, if you will do this, then I will do that. Genesis 15, 5 and 6, which we talked about last week. And he took him outside. I can just imagine Abraham being taken outside by God. What a magnificent thing that would have been. Though he cannot see him, no one can look upon God and be, but God took him outside. And look toward the heavens and count the stars. If you are able to, if you are able to count them, he didn't say count them all. He says, if you are able to, and he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Then he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Right here in this little congregation are descendants of Abraham through the promise. The promise should be a capital T, the promise, which draws attention to promise. The sky that God showed to Abraham at that time was a brilliant and magnificent sky. It is not confused and confounded by city lights. If you want to really see the sky, you have to drive out in the country to see it. You have to go out in the wilderness, so to say. Yeah. And that's where all of God's children's heart should dwell in the wilderness with God and not absorbing the things of the world or enjoying those things. If you can count the stars in heaven, then you will have some idea of what your eternal influence will be, Abraham. There will be children born to you as innumerable 
as the stars in the heavens. Abraham's seed would have eternal influence that will never end. So the Lord made a covenant in Genesis 15, 18. And that's Genesis 15, 18. You need to read that. Is literally the Lord cut a covenant. He cut it in a way that was familiar to the people of that time in, in the ancient Near East, but it is very unfamiliar to us. They would take a heifer and a ram and a goat. They would split the animal in half and they would lay the two sides opposing each other and it would be on a little incline that sloped down into a little, like a little dip in the ground and all the blood would run from those animals down into that dip. And then the stronger of the two that was making the covenant would walk through that blood. And he said, this is what will be done to me if I do not keep that promise to you. And then the weaker of the two would walk through that. And it is to say, if I fail in any way to keep this covenant, this is what you may do to me. Abraham, if you've read this, and I'm sure most of us here have read that, Abraham was either asleep at the time or he was groggy from the deep sleep that he was in. Maybe he had too many PMs or, I'm sorry, that was uncalled for. But we do not know for sure. He sees God do an amazing thing. God passes through the animal parts all by himself. And Abraham is sitting on the sidelines watching you see, Jesus Christ took part in, in the cross all by himself. And we, recipients of the curse he took for us, just sat on the sidelines watching the recipients of grace because he became a curse for us. And then the question is, do you not think he deserves our love to the fullest in our adoration and our worship? Does he not deserve for us to consider his day a worthy day to come and worship him? I'm not speaking to those here now, but those that are not here who have decided that there was something better to do on Labor Day. My heart cries for them. It does. Because it reminds me of my own sinfulness and the mercy that he had on me in all the years that I avoided the church and the gathering together, the assembling together to give glory and honor to God. Oh. He deserves our glory. All who become before me, I will be treated as holy. What's the preparation of our heart when we come to hear his word? Do we think about it on the way to church? That's only what I personally can answer and what you personally can answer. God in that vision represented, he was represented by a smoking oven and a burning torch and he passed through the animal parts by himself. As Abram watched, God showed that this was a one-sided covenant, a promise. Abraham never signed the covenant. God sealed it for them both. So the certainty of the covenant God made with Abraham is based on who God is, not on who Abraham is or what Abraham does. This covenant will never fail because God has sealed it. Abraham cannot break a contract that he never signed. So back to our text, Galatians 3.16 again. 
Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say seeds is referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed that is Christ. Paul informs us that the promises were given to Abraham and his seed. Seed points to the person. The seed is not simply one descendant among many, but the descendant. It is from Christ that grace flows, which constitutes Christians. Christians are those who believe God as Abraham did. They therefore are spiritual seed. The Abrahamic covenant arises from the very first promise in the Bible. This covenant was foretold in Genesis 3.15. And God declared to the serpent, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, which is a death blow, and you shall bruise him on the heel, from which he will recover and rise from the grave. Both the seed in Genesis 3.15 and the seed in Genesis 15.6 is in reference to the seed of Abraham. It does not intend a whole bunch of seeds or many descendants, but one seed, Jesus Christ himself. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. In Luke, the first chapter, we read about the birth of John the Baptist, Zacharias, filled with the Holy Spirit. He sang a song of praise. If you read that, some of the most magnificent words that come out of Scripture is what, what Zacharias proclaim to God. They're just, just beautiful. And this is, this is what he's saying. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from old. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. To show mercy towards our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. Which holy covenant was that? The covenant he made with Abraham. The oath which he swore to Abraham our father. Being informed by the angel Gabriel. Do you know what Gabriel means? Hero of God. I would say he was. Because <laughs> he was there when any time anything had to do with the birth of Jesus Christ. It was Gabriel that was chosen to announce and, and trumpet the birth of our Lord and Savior. And he was informed by the angel Gabriel that his son will proclaim Christ to his people. He praised God for performing the oath which he swore to Abraham, our father. You see, it was Gabriel that talked to Zacharias the mouthpiece of the, of the Lord, our God. It always had to do with something of the arrival of our Lord. Paul qualifies the word seed. One reason that the word seed in the Greek can be used many ways is because we can use it that way in English. When we say seed, it could mean many. When he says that the promise was given to Abraham and his seed, he's declaring a special seed, a seed or descendant who would be found only in one person. Since Christ is the heir of the promises, all those and only those who are in Christ by faith are beneficiaries of the irrevocable trust agreement God made with Abraham. For the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Romans 11.29 Galatians 3.29 and if you belong to Christ. Seeing you are his, not by creation only, but as the Father's gift to Jesus. Wow. <laughs> We're gifts. We're gifts to Jesus by the purchase of his own blood, by the power of his grace, making us willing ourselves to Christ 
not only by our confession of faith, by saying we are the Lord's, we are calling ourselves Christians, and also possessions. Christ dwelling in our hearts through faith and having his spirit as a regenerating power and a sanctifying power that works in us for God's purpose. Then you are Abraham's offspring. You are heirs according to the promise. Being children of God, they are heirs of God. Being the spiritual children of Abraham, they are children of promise. They are counted as the seed. They are according to the promise made to Abraham and his spiritual seed, heirs and of the blessings of the grace of life, beneficiaries of the covenant of grace, incorruptible and undefiled inheritors with the saints in light to which they are made proper by the grace of Christ to become. What does that mean, made proper? You're made righteous. So when God established his covenant with Abraham in Genesis 12 and then expanded on it in Genesis 15 through 17, what was Abraham thinking? Did he, I wonder if did he comprehend all that was going to happen? I really doubt it. What did he expect? Did he look for an earthly fulfillment? Did Abraham just see the type or did he look past the natural to the spiritual? Unequivocally, he understood something that was very deep. Because in Hebrews 11.10, it says, For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And it also says that Abraham saw it and rejoiced. And when was the date of this trust? Galatians 3.17. What I'm saying is this, the law which came 430 years later does not invalidate the covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise made to Abraham. And we saw clearly from Scripture that God cut cut the covenant. The promise and agreement cannot be mixed together with one another because they accomplish absolutely different results. The fact that the law came 430 years later cannot invalidate the great life-giving promise that God made to Abraham. And that life-giving promise is original and it still stands. So, what is the condition of inheritance? Galatians 3.18 For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise, but God granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. So we'll wrap up with this. The conclusion. We have been given to Christ. With him we have received the inheritance everlasting life according to the promise made to Abraham and to his seed. And again, Ephesians 1.18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the hope of his calling? Who did he call? You. And what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Amen.